Hi everyone, it's Dr. C here, Dr. Curry, and today we're going to talk about effective listening, specifically in work environments. Now, this is a topic that is particularly important to me, and I love to teach about listening because I think back over the success that I had in my professional career before going back to school for my PhD in teaching, and um, I worked in the financial services industry, and I had a lot of success there. I started off as a loan officer. Um, was really, really successful in that role. That led to the opportunity to become a sales manager um, for Bank of America Home Loans, where I was 24 years old and managing a branch of about 50 employees. That, that is a topic for discussion in a different lecture. Um, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of students often ask me, well, Dr. Curry, well, what were some of the reasons why you were successful professionally? And I always go back to the fact that I was a really good listener. And being a good listener really changed the equation for me professionally. And it led to a lot of opportunity for me. Later in life, as an investment banker for Wells Fargo, again, listening, the skill of listening, was something that really allowed me to be successful. And there's a key word there that I just mentioned, which you've heard, we've heard in um, other lectures, which is skill. Listening is a skill, and so again, if something is a skill, that implies that with time and with practice, we can become better at it. And that's going to be the focus of today's lecture, how we can become better listeners, especially in work environments. Now, this quote by Taylor Caldwell um, was one of my favorite quotes about listening, especially pre-COVID-19. Now, yeah, you could argue that we really do need a vaccine right now in terms of COVID-19, and so... Uh, maybe the first part of this isn't as as profound as it was in the in a pre-COVID environment, but I think you could still argue that the need for good listening skills is actually probably even stronger today in a pre in in a COVID nineteen environment because of the limitations of face to face interaction. So when we are doing a lot of our work from home. Um, when we're doing more telephone calls or we're, when we're even physically present with others, we're socially distanced. That changes the equation. And so being a good listener is even more important, I think, today than it was pre-COVID-19, if we're looking at the, the whole picture. But I do love this quote that says, the most desperate need of men today is not a new vaccine for any disease, our new religion, our new way of life. Man does not need to go to the moon or other solar systems. He does not require bigger and better bombs and missiles. His real need, his most terrible need, is for someone to listen to him, not as a patient, but as a human soul. That's a pretty strong quote, and I think it's true because at the basic, one of the basic core needs that we have as human beings is this desire to be accepted to feel like we are heard, to feel like we are understood, both in our personal relationships and in our professional relationships. And so when we are good listeners, we, um, we encourage that and we display that and we make other people feel seen and valued and appreciated. And that is really a positive thing, especially in professional context. So what is listening? Well, listening is the ability to accurately receive and interpret messages in the communication process. So both sending and receiving. Listening is key to effective communication because without our ability to listen effectively, keyword there effectively, messages are easily misunderstood. So one of the cool things about listening is if you were to ask people, are you a good listener? Like, you know, not in the context of this lecture. If you didn't know we were doing this lecture and you say, hey, are you a good listener? Most people would say, yeah, I'm a pretty good listener. Most people aren't going to say, you know what? No, I'm a really bad listener. But in truth, most people are not really good listeners. There's a lot of room for improvement there. A lot of, and one of the mistakes that people make that we're going to talk about here in a moment is that people assume that the majority of our communication is spoken, is spoken word, and that's just not true. Of our time spent communicating, 22% of that is spent reading, 23% speaking, and 55% of all of our communication is, is done by listening. 
that's an incredible statistic. So really, one of the least things that we do is actually speak. Most of our time is spent listening. So you can see where this will benefit you if you improve your listening skills. Now, I do want to note that there are four main organs that we tend to use when we listen, and these are pretty self-explanatory. We physically hear or listen with our ears. We also um, listen with our heart. We listen with our brain. Um, there's a cognitive ability there, uh, and un a need to understand what's actually being spoken or said, and that goes back to language and communication, the core concept of communication. We need to be able to understand the symbols and, the, and what those symbols mean um, cognitively. So we use our brain in order to do that. Now our eyes, that's an interesting one because maybe you've heard this, the phrase or, um, seeing is believing, where sometimes things, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes things are so crazy um, or abnormal that if someone tells us something is happening, we don't believe them. We have to see it to believe it. And sometimes we can see things with our own eyes and still not believe it. And that's because we also use our heart to listen. Most of the time we see this in our personal relationships, especially if you think romantic relationships. Maybe someone you love or care about hurts you. They say or they do something that hurts you. And you see it. You see the action. You see them do something, or you see the results or the consequences of those actions. But because you love them, because you love and care and value that relationship, um, maybe you don't interpret it for what it really is. And that's indicative of how we use our heart to listen. And that can quite honestly complicate things in a negative, in a negative way sometimes. Now the textbook talks about four faulty assumptions about listening. And I do think these are important to cover. And so what are some of the mistakes that we make about listening? We're going to talk about each of these briefly. But the first is that effective communication is the sender's responsibility. Second, listening is passive. Talking has more advantages. And the fourth is listening is a natural ability. So let's dive into these a little bit deeper. So the first faulty assumption is that uh, effective communication is the sender's responsibility. And that's simply not true because both senders and receivers share responsibility for effective communication. So as a sender of a message, if I'm communicating to you, I've got to be able to communicate clearly um, whatever the message is. So for me, the message of this the message that I'm communicating now is the importance of listening. I have to be able to effectively communicate that to you, to communicate clearly um, that message to you in order for you to, to understand and then subsequently to take action, which in this case would be to practice and become a better listener. So when we think about effective communication in this sense, one of the key things for the sender of the message is to be able to monitor what's going on around around them. So if we were in a classroom setting, I would do this as a teacher. I would do this by reading your nonverbal um, feedback as well as your verbal feedback. Are you engaged? Are you asking questions? Um, are you looking my direction? Are you making eye contact? All sorts of these things that would demonstrate that you're following along, that you're taking part uh, in the, the conversation, even if I'm primarily the only one speaking in that instance of the, the teacher-student relationship. So some of the mistakes or some of the reasons why this is difficult in terms of why we often think that, well, it's just the sender's responsibility, is because listening takes work. You know, as someone who's listening to a message that and someone else is primarily speaking, well, it takes work. Even right now, you're probably thinking about other things. Maybe what you got going on uh, later in the day, or maybe you're hungry, or you're just stressed out, or you, you know, whatever it is, there are other things that you've thought about even over the course of the very short introduction to this lecture. And it highlights the fact that listening takes work, and that um, it's hard for us. We have short attention spans because of other things going on. We also like to think ahead. So if we go back to our introduction to communication lecture where we talked about symbols and 
um, the letter C and then the letter A and how you thought ahead in your own head and you filled that next letter in because cognitively, cognitively it's important. Our brains are thinking ahead. We have to be able to respond quickly and so we, we try to think ahead to see where someone is going in a conversation. And that in its very nature makes it more difficult for us to be a good listener. We're also busy. We have we lead busy lives. We have a lot of things going on. You're probably multitasking, trying to do more things, more than one thing at one time. And so that complicates being a good listener. And we also feel this urgency to express ourselves. If someone tells us a story about something going on in their own life, we look for ways that we can relate to them and we often feel the need to interject and say, oh, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've this happened to me and then we interject our own information and that sometimes isn't um, isn't beneficial or a nice thing to do we, we need to be a good listener um, and allow the sender of that message uh, to dictate uh, what what it is that they're trying to get across the second faulty assumption is that listening is passive and what we mean by this is that there is a difference in listening and in hearing. So we often assume, well, to listen, you know, it's passive. All, all I'm doing is really just hearing what someone says. Well, there is a difference in hearing and in listening. So hearing is described as the absorption of, of an actual sound. So hearing is the reception of sound. Just physically using our ears to hear sound. That's hearing. Listening is then when we take whatever we've heard through physically hearing via our ears and then we attach meaning to that. We attach meaning to that sound based off of our own experiences, our own understanding of language. So there is a difference in listening and in hearing. And listening isn't passive. It isn't just something that we do with our ears. Um, that's hearing. Listening involves so much more than that. Um, I mentioned in the last slide, so we can, we can do this. We can, we can show that we are being active in the, in the process by the nonverbals that we, that we give. We can show we're interested by providing feedback, both verbal and nonverbal. And in fact, our body language is often the clearest indicator of if someone is actually um, are actively listening to us. We read people's body language. And sometimes we may even say, are, are you listening? Are you, are you paying attention? I'm trying to tell you something. The third faulty assumption that I want to talk about is that um, talking is this myth that talking has more advantages, that, that listening is the least um, important thing that we do, that it's the spoken word that produces the most effect. And that's just not true. In, in fact, we're going to talk about nonverbals in uh, another lecture, and it's the spoken word, the actual word spoken, um, isn't what produces impact or effect with us when we hear. It's more about tone and how um, a message is indicated to us that matters. And we don't have to physically speak uh, to be a good communicator. In fact, some of the best communicators I know are people that I would consider um, people of few words or fewer words. They listen more than they speak, more than they talk. And that can really be impactful uh, especially in professional settings, especially if you're in a management position, you need to be able to listen to your employees and get a sense for how they feel. Um, and you can only do that effectively if you spend more time listening than you actually spend talking. Now, there's assumption here, you know, we need to highlight listening isn't easy. As I said again, and this is especially important here too in terms of speaking, we absorb that information that someone gives us and then we provide that verbal and that nonverbal feedback. But again, it isn't easy um, in regards to listening. The fourth faulty assumption is that listening is a natural ability. Um, and this is a myth. You are not born a good listener. In fact, um, 
unless you've really practiced the art of, of becoming a good listener, you're you're gonna struggle or you there's room for uh, improvement we aren't trained or taught to be good listeners in fact if you think back to your educational experiences um, you've probably had math classes science classes English classes maybe you have even had a public speaking class a class that focuses on the spoken word how many classes have you taken how many lectures have you had around listening Probably not a lot. And that's because we aren't trained or taught to be good listeners. And if we tie that back to the percentages that we looked at earlier, where over half of our half of communication is spent listening, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Most of our communication is spent listening, but yet we don't train students or train people or teach people to be better listeners. Well, you guys are being trained and taught that via this course and this lecture, so you're inherently going to have an advantage over most folks. Um, no one really thinks they're a bad listener. I alluded to this earlier. You could ask 100 people, how many of you think you're a bad listener? And only two or three, uh, statistically speaking, would say that they're a bad listener. Most people think they're a good listener. Uh, and when we think we're good at something and we're really not, that can impede our ability to, to, to grow in that area. So another barrier, um, uh, the, the book talks about barriers to effective listening. And we can go through some of these and talk about them. Um, but we're not going to do it in a lot of detail. There are environmental barriers. For instance, noise in a room. So if there's a lot of people talking in a room, it's going to be harder for you to listen to someone in a, in a more direct one-on-one -on -one type of conversation. Um, maybe it's a cell phone going off or a television playing in the background. Those are environmental barriers that prevent you from being able to um, listen effectively. So if you've got Netflix or Hulu or YouTube playing in the background right now, pause it. Pay attention and listen uh, to the lecture. It eliminate the environmental barriers around you. There are also physiological barriers, and that could be an actual hearing deficiency. Um, we have psychological barriers, and we've talked about this. Maybe we're just preoccupied or we're busy. Maybe it's message overload. Your boss comes at you, and they're just throwing a lot of stuff at you at one time, and it's too much for you to process and to take in, so you have message overload. Egocentrism, this is tied to the whole ethnocentrism idea from um, our diversity lecture, which is the belief that our way of seeing things is the correct way and is the best way. And people who practice egocentrism uh, in listening, that just means that we don't listen um, the way that we should or actively listen to folks that we believe, um, if we believe that their experiences are different from ours, maybe it's a cultural difference, and we just say, you know what, no, because I'm practicing ethnocentrism, this belief that my way of seeing things is the best way, um, in the only way, then I'm not even going to listen. And, and that might be subconscious that we do that. It may be consciously, but there's also a lot of times subconsciously, and we just don't listen um, if we believe our way of seeing or doing things is the best way. And here's the one that I really want to talk about, because I think this is the one that, that people struggle with in my experience, professional experience, uh, is the fear of looking ignorant. This quote here, your fear of looking stupid is holding you back. That's why we say things like, well, I've, I'm sorry, I've, I've got a stupid question. And your teacher at some point in time in your life has probably said, no, no, there is no stupid question. Adults do this. I was in a, a Zoom WebEx meeting just last week and someone, um, they got to the question and answer session part of the, of the presentation and someone says, I've got a stupid question. Um, so we carry this mentality with us throughout our entire life is this fear of looking stupid and we don't want to look stupid. And so we'll preface our questions with saying, I've got a stupid question or I'm sorry, I don't really get this or understand this. But what a lot of folks do is 
they just don't ask the questions that they need to ask. And in professional work settings, this can be detrimental. If, if especially if you're new in a job, this is the, the mistake that I see, see folks make. They're new in a job and they don't want their boss to feel like they're incompetent or that they're struggling. And so they act like they know um, what's expected of them or they uh, act like they know what they need to do and maybe they, maybe they don't. Maybe they do have questions. There is no shame. There is, there is nothing stupid about telling your boss, our colleagues, or anyone around you, hey, I, I need a little bit more information. Um, I've, I'm, I've not done this before, or I'm struggling a little bit with, can you clarify this for me? There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, when we take that approach and we, and we say that to people, we say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with, with this, um, and this is my understanding. So I need to do this and then this, etc. That actually is the definition of active listening, is when we can repeat stuff back and get clarification. People respect us more in those instances, and so do not be afraid to ask questions, um, personally or professionally. You will be a better listener because of it. You will be a better employee because of it. You will have more success because of it. So as we conclude, why is effective listening important? Well, as we've mentioned, you probably don't listen as effectively as you think you do, and you probably didn't even know it until we talked about some of these things today. But research has found that if you listen effectively, you're going to get a few things out of folks. One, you're simply going to get more information. So the better the listener you are, the more information you're going to get from people. And that's important. Because with more information, you can make better, more informed decisions. And that's important, especially in work settings. If you're in a sales-related job, that's really important, being able to get more information. If you're in the nursing field or medical field, well, you the more information you get from someone regarding a patient, regarding how they feel, the the more informed you're going to be able in terms of making a diagnose, diagnosis or providing care. Um, maybe you're selling cars or you're a realtor, you're selling houses. You, you need information from people. The more information you have, the better you're going to be in that professional role. If you're selling cars and someone, someone has three kids and they want something that they can haul them around in safely and have space, you're probably not going to try to sell them a Chevrolet Spark, which is a really, really tiny car, right? You're, they're going to need something bigger. If someone has, um, if it's just themselves and they're looking to buy a house, most people are not going to want a 5,000 square foot house for just themselves. So as a realtor, I would need to know, okay, well, what is it that you're looking for? That information is critical to being successful in that professional setting. I did this in mortgages. One of the reasons I was successful was because I listened to people. I asked questions instead of just people would call and say, hey, what's the interest rates? Well, I could give them an interest rate. Well, interest rate's going to be anywhere between 4 to 6%, depending upon a few things like your credit history um, and down payment. I'd be happy to give you a detailed interest rate if I could get a little bit of more information from you today. No, no thank you. I was just checking interest rates. Click. Well, I didn't get that sell. I didn't get that loan. And it was an industry where I was commission-based. So the more loans I did, the better I did financially. So I learned that I could give interest rates, but I could, I could also ask follow-up questions that would get people talking. Sometimes people struggle with, well, how do I get more information from folks? How do I listen better? Well, just get people to talk. You're going to get more information from them, and the more information you get, the, the better you can be in that role. So I would ask folks and say, well, have you already found a house? Yeah, I have. Oh, tell me a little bit about it. Oh, well, it's a cute little brick home, three bedroom, two bath. Um, you know, we just recently had a baby and we're looking to um, 
to, to get into something bigger. Oh, congratulations! What what's your what's your kid's name? Oh, well, we have we have two sons. We have Zach, who's seven, and Isaiah, who is just turned six months. Well, that information is important for me to know because it tells me where they are in the process, etc. But it also gets them talking, and when you get people talking and you listen, it builds a connection. And that connection is important. Again, it goes back to that original quote I said where people feel the need to feel connected, to feel heard, to feel valued, appreciated, to feel like we see them. And when we get people talk to talk to us and give us information, we're going to get more information, but we're also going to build those relationships. And that's critical to success. As a result, you're going to increase people's trust in you. You will reduce conflict in your personal and professional lives. I promise you, especially in your personal relationships, you will never have um, a significant other, a spouse who comes to you and says, you know what? Gosh, you're just too good of a listener. Like that is not something someone says. People value good listening skills. It will reduce conflict in your personal relationships, also your professional relationships. Um, it will help you better understand how to motivate other people. So that scenario I gave you about mortgages, well, I understand in that instance that, you know, they're they're purchasing a house because it's a new chapter for them. They've got um, their family has grown, and it means new memories and room for them to grow. It gives me a better understanding of what's motivating them to make that purchase. And um, you will inspire a higher level of commitment in the people around you. If you think about your own personal relationships, we provide more commitment to folks who we consider to be good listeners. I guarantee you, you do not commit your time, your energy, your focus, your dedication to relationships in your life where you don't feel seen, heard, valued, or appreciated. We push those relationships to the back burner. We push those friendships to the back burner because we want people around us who inspire us, who um, provide this commitment to us. And oftentimes those folks are the people that we consider to be good listeners, to be um, the best listeners in our life. It's that friend that you call when you've had a bad day and you really need someone to listen. You really want to talk to someone. Well, you're not going to call the friend that interrupts constantly to tell you their their stories or their experiences. You're going to call that friend who who listens, who um, doesn't interject, who provides that focus, that care to that conversation. There's a psychological component to it. I want to end our lecture today with giving you something very specific that you can use in terms of listening as a professional skill set. And I call this last, a customer service skill set. And that is if you're dealing with a customer who is upset or angry, you want to apply last, this acronym. You can remember that by saying, you know what? Customer's upset, customer's angry. I want to be the last person they have to talk to um, for them to get the situation resolved. So let's look. Each of these letters stands for something. And the, the L, ironically, listen. Um, again, you want to just, li you want to get someone to tell you what their experience is. So you can say, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that, that this has been your experience. Can you tell me a little bit? Can you tell me a little bit about what's happened? And 80% of folks who are angry and upset just won't to tell you that they're angry and upset. So maybe you work in a professional setting uh, where you've seen this, where you've had a customer really upset or angry about something and they, they tell you and they tell you about their experience and then they're okay. As they tell you about what happened to them, they start to feel better about the situation because you're listening. So if, you, if you're a good listener, um, this really helps um, bring the level of, of anger and issue down um, if you deal with this personally. So you want to listen. You want to give someone the opportunity to vent. You don't want to interject. You don't want to make them feel like it's their fault or their issue. You want to listen um, and you want to listen apologetically. 
And that takes us to the A, and that's to apologize. So after you've listened, you want to say again, I'm really sorry that that was your experience. That is not how we do business around here. Um, that is not how we want our customers to be treated. And I apologize that that, that happened to you. I, I, I am sorry for that experience. People value a genuine apology. The S in last stands for solve. You want to be able to solve the problem or you want to be able to offer a solution. So if, if a customer is upset about, say you're at a restaurant and your steak came out undercooked, well, they're going to tell you, oh, you know, I've never had this happen before. My steak, I waited 45 minutes and then my steak isn't even cooked and it's undercooked. Well, the, um, the immediate resolution to that would be to, to cook them a new steak um, to the correct temperature that they want it. So that would be a way that you could solve the problem. And then the solve the problem always ties directly into the T in last, which is to thank them. You want to thank them for being a customer. You want to thank them for their patience. You want to thank them for sharing their experience. Um, I did this other day with T-Mobile. We've been with them for like eight years and we had an issue in service and I called in and at the end she says, uh, the customer service representative, she says, you know, thank you, Mr. Curry, for being with us for eight years. We appreciate um, you, we, we appreciate your loyalty to us and we appreciate you bringing this matter to our attention um, and we hope that um, we're able to resolve this issue moving forward for you. And there's something subconscious when they do that. They're thanking you for eight years of service or eight years of loyalty to their company because they realize that most people, even when we're upset, we're not going to immediately end a relationship, personal or professional. We're going to try to work through it. And so if you've had a bad experience with a company and you've been with them a while, we're likely to give them another chance, right? It's difficult to change cell phone carriers. I don't want to port my number over and I have to unlock my phone and all of these things, right? So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, if over time I continue to have bad experiences, then that's a different um, a different story. So you want to thank someone um, for bringing the issue to your attention. You want to thank them for being a valued customer, etc. That is important. So again, remember, last. You want to be the last person they talk to to fix the issue. You want to listen. You want to apologize. You want to solve their problem. If you can't solve their problem, find someone who can. There's nothing worse than than me being upset and telling you a 10 minute story about how horrible my experience has been. And then you say, you know what? Well, I'm so sorry, but I mean, I can't actually fix that. Um, I'm, I've got to get you to someone else. Um, can I put you on hold while I transfer you? And then someone else picks up and they're like, uh, hi, um, my name is so-and-so. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on? I'm like, what, what do you mean can I tell you what's going on? I just spent 20 minutes telling someone else my problem and they put me on hold and now they transferred me. Now I'm even angrier than I was to begin with. And that's why you'll see, maybe you've had companies do this where you'll call and they'll say, you know what, I I can't fix the problem, but I'm going to get someone who can and I'm going to I'm gonna fill them in so they know what's going on um, and then we're going to fix this together, okay? And then they bring someone online they say, hey, uh, Mr. Curry, thank you so much. For holding, I have Sam on the phone, and um, I've told Sam about the problem, and um, Sam's going to be able to, to help get a resolution for this. So you want to avoid avoid that if possible. Um, you don't want to be transferring people or um, trying to provide a solution if you don't actually have the capability or ability uh, to do that. Sometimes that just may be, you need a manager in order uh, to do that. Um, and then you want to thank them for their, um, again, thank them for bringing it to your attention, etc. And for their loyalty. So my final thought and takeaway is this. Your expert advice that you didn't even ask for is if you're truly interested in getting information and solving problems, you'll ask questions. You'll stop talking and you'll listen.
Now, in a more abrupt, in-your-face way, you can say just shut up and listen. That sounds harsh to say, but sometimes I remind myself that. These conversations in my head, if I'm, especially if I'm having an argument with someone, personal or professional, I tell myself this little voice in my head kicks in and says, Rick, shut up and listen. Don't interject. Now's not the time. Listen. Provide eye contact. Show that you care. Show that you value their opinion, that you appreciate them sharing this with you. Just shut up and listen. Um, by doing that, you get more information. You're more likely to solve the problem, and people will respect you more. Uh, they will stop and think that you're a better listener, and overall, they'll think your relationship quality is better. Good listening makes us more empathic, and empathy is one of the most valuable things we have in building relationships. When people listen to us, we value that. It builds those relationships. So listening is a skill set that we have um, that you can improve upon with time and practice. And so again, I'll end with this quote, especially that our real need, our most terrible need, is for someone to listen to us, not as patience, but as a human soul. Focus on becoming a better listener, and I guarantee you, I promise you, you will see a positive impact in your personal and your professional relationships.